Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Authors' Corner. I'm Diane Okonski. I'm the president of the Icelandic National League of the United States, and I'm so happy you could join us. Uh, before we get started with tonight's program, I just have a couple of reminders. The first one is that the program is being recorded and will be available on the INLUS website uh, within a week. So if, uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, re-see uh, re this program or tell your friends about it, uh, you can go to the INLUS.org website and uh, um, just click on the links. Uh, the second reminder is that uh, we really welcome your questions and uh, we will answer as many as we can during the program uh, this evening. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on an iPad or an iPhone uh, or other tablet, the button may be in a different location, but please find it and uh, don't be afraid to ask your questions. We really want to get to as many as possible uh, during the program. So tonight we have with us Nancy Marie Brown, uh, who is going to introduce us to her new book, uh, The Real Valkyrie, The Hidden History of Viking Warrior Women. Um, this book actually just went on sale yesterday, so it's still hot off the press. Uh, helping with the, uh, with the interview this evening is Carrie Kazubel. And if you were uh, part of our uh, webinar in May on Icelandic horses, uh, Nancy and uh, Carrie will look familiar. They, uh, they were the team that, uh, that helped uh, with that program. Uh, so we are both... Uh, <laughs> Both happy to have them here uh, tonight with us, uh, and uh, uh, I can't wait to hear what uh, what we have uh, have coming in terms of, of slides and discussions. So, Carrie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Diane. Good evening, everyone. I am Carrie Kazool, and uh, I am a proud member of the INL US and interested in all things Icelandic. I am also a fan of tonight's guest, Nancy Marie Brown. I feel like she needs no introduction because if you're here, you probably already know who she is. She's a, a scholar, a historian, a talented author. We were discussing earlier, I think this is her eighth book. Most of them are on my bookshelf, I'm happy to say. And um, an incredible ambassador for Iceland. And as Diane mentioned, we're lucky to have her with us tonight to talk about her brand new book, The Real Valkyrie, which I know many of you have pre-ordered and will be getting into your hands very soon. You will not be disappointed. If you haven't pre-ordered, I encourage you to walk into or call your local bookstore and harass them for it. Um, we are, as Diane mentioned, we are leaving time for questions, so please do use that Q&A function and we'll make sure your questions get asked. Um, and it, I know most people haven't had a chance to read the book yet, so if there, even if you don't have a question about the book specifically, if you have a, a general writing question for, for Nancy, um, she'd be happy to answer those too. So, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to the woman we all came to hear, Nancy Mar Marie Brown. Thank you very much, Carrie. That was nice. Um, I'm going to start with a short reading from the introduction to uh, The Real Valkyrie. So here's how the book begins. All I have are her bones. I don't know her name or precisely where or when she was born. I don't know how she died, though bones often do betray such secrets. All I have are her bones, now boxed and stored in a museum in Sweden, bones gathered by an archeologist in 1878 from a grave beside a hill fort overlooking the Viking town of Birka, where she was buried in the mid 10th century in a spacious wood-lined pit. To tell her story, all I have are her bones and what was unearthed with her. An ax blade, two spearheads, a two-edged sword, a clutch of arrows, their shafts embellished with silver thread, a long sax knife in a bronze ringed sheath, iron bosses for two round shields, a short bladed knife, a whetstone, a set of game pieces, 
bundled in her lap, a large bronze bowl, much repaired, a comb, a snip of a silver coin, three traders' weights, two stirrups, two bridles bits, and spikes to ride a horse on the ice, along with the bones of two horses, a stallion and a mare. Of her clothing, all that remains are an iron cloak pin, a filigreed silver cone, four baubles or buttons of coiled silver wire, strips of silk embroidered with silver, and a scattering of mirrored sequins. Until 2017, when DNA tests proved the bones were female, this grave, numbered BJ581, was held up as the classic Viking warrior's grave. Quote, the position of the skeleton, wrote a Swedish archaeologist in 1966, gave the impression that he had been sitting in the grave rather than laid out. The equipment indicates that this is a warrior's grave rather than that of a merchant. The date of a silver coin found underneath the skeleton of the dead man provides a fairly good idea of the date of the grave, 913 to 980 AD. The implications of the dead man turning into a dead woman dazzle me. They ignite my imagination. A burial with weapons and horses, an archeologist claimed as late as 2008, used a widely recognized symbolic language of lordship, one that was unquestionably masculine. To assume that all such weapons graves are male now seems to me to be a mistake, one that has skewed our image of the Viking Age. How does history change if we turn that assumption on its head? There are other ways to interpret the grave, other ways to explain a female body buried with weapons, but the simplest seems to me the most likely. Defending their findings in 2019, the team that tested her DNA said, BJ581, quote, suggests to us that at least one Viking Age woman adopted a professional warrior lifestyle. They added, we would be very surprised if she was alone in the Viking world. So I'm going to give you a little introduction to the real Valkyrie uh, with some slides. I'm going to share my screen now. All right, I think you're looking at the same thing I'm looking at. When I started writing this book, I thought it was going to be a book about bones, about what the new technologies uh, in archaeology can tell us when we're looking at bones that were dug up a oh, hundred years ago. It turned out to be a book about bias. That's the problem with thinking of archaeology as a science. Nobody can repeat the experiment. Here is the original site plan of the Viking burial at the heart of my book. It was excavated in 1878. Other than this faded drawing and a few notes, all we have are boxes of bones and artifacts with the number 581 inked on them. Anything you read or see about this burial, Birka Grave BJ581 or the Birka Warrior Woman is an interpretation, including the gender of the burial. Archaeologists are taught that a woman's skull is smoother and more rounded. Her long bones are more slender. Her pelvis is shaped differently than a man's. But there's no absolute scientific scale for smoother, rounder, or more slender, or even for pelvic structure. Plus, few Viking skeletons are in good shape. After a thousand years in the soil, the bones are degraded or missing. In cremation burials, the bones were burned and then crushed. Yet archaeologists still sex these graves. How? It's called sexing by metal. Jewelry for women, especially these oval brooches that hold up the straps of an apron dress, and weapons for men. It sounds logical 
Surely it's based on statistics, right? It's not. The practice began in 1837, before archaeology as a science even existed. It reflects the values of Victorian society, when women were confined to the home and told to concern themselves only with children, church, and kitchen. Our picture of the Viking Age is largely drawn from sagas, poems, and laws that were written down in Iceland at least 200 years after the Norse converted to Christianity, 200 years after their culture radically changed. Studying old Icelandic literature, I was taught that Norse culture was divided along strict gender lines. I described it my, that way myself in my previous books. The woman ruled in and stocks, inside the threshold, where she held considerable power, for she was in charge of clothing and food. The housewife decided who froze and who starved, but the man held the dominant role in all walks of life, I was taught. He was the trader, the traveler, the warrior. His symbol was the sword. The woman's role was symbolized by the keys she carried at her belt, except she didn't. Keys have been found in some Viking women's graves, but they are not common. Against the 3,000 swords found in Viking Age Norway, a Norwegian archaeologist in 2015 sets only 143 keys, half of which were found in men's graves. An archaeologist in Denmark in 2011 found only nine out of 102 female graves she studied contained keys. Calling keys the symbol of a Viking woman's status, these researchers say, is an archeological misinterpretation, a mistake, and a dangerous one. By accepting the Victorian stereotype of men with swords and women with keys, we legitimize the idea that women should stay at home. We reduce the role models for every modern girl who visits a museum or reads a history book. We make it hard to even imagine a Viking warrior woman like the one buried in Birka grave BJ581, or like this one, found by a man using a metal detector near the village of Harby in Denmark in 2012. Oops, there we are. This intricately detailed figurine of gilded silver about an inch tall, shows a woman with long hair twisted into a ponytail. She carries a sword and shield. Her official label in the Danish National Museum reads Valkyrie figure. By calling her a Valkyrie, the experts are saying she is not real. The standard definition of Valkyrie, as you probably know, comes from Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda. Writing in Iceland around 1220, this Christian educated chieftain described Valkyries as pagan battle goddesses who ferried dead heroes to Valhalla and served them cups of mead. Trusting Snorri, who was well known in his lifetime for being untrustworthy, scholars classify Valkyries as mythological. They are firmly supernatural or at most semi-human. Valkyrie images are found throughout the Viking world from Britain on the left to Russia on the right. Why don't we assume these images depict real women? Sexing by metal again, I think. If all weapons graves are labeled male, people assume only men were warriors. Images of women with weapons, along with the many Valkyries and shield maids found in sagas and histories, poems and laws must be supernatural or at most, semi-human. Is the man on the left also supernatural? Is the woman on the right fixing her hair or turning into a cat? How do we interpret these images when each of them is less than an inch tall? Most are stray finds, not even found in the context of a grave. As archeologist Neil Price has quipped, they don't come with labels. At a conference in 2016, I met Neil, who heads the Viking Phenomenon Project at Uppsala University. I told him I was writing a book about Valkyries and asked if he could refer me to an archaeologist, 
preferably a woman, who was an expert on a Viking Age weapons grave, preferably the burial of a woman. He looked at me funny. I can't talk about that yet, he said. A year later, he and Charlotte Hedenstierna Janssen and their colleagues published A Female Viking Warrior Confirmed by Genomics. They received so many negative comments that they published an expanded paper in 2019, Viking Warrior Women Reassessing Birka Grave BJ581. BJ581 is the burial at the heart of my book, The Real Valkyrie. It was one of 1,100 graves dug up near the Viking town of Birka in Sweden in the late 1800s. The boxes of bones and artifacts are stored in the Historical Museum in Stockholm. Until 2017, when the DNA tests were done, BJ581, as I said, was held up as the classic Viking warrior's grave. The illustration on the left from a book published in 2011 shows BJ581 as a red bearded man. On the right is how the 2017 and 2019 papers depict her. What does the Viking world look like if we abandon the stereotypes? What does it look like if roles are assigned not according to Victorian concepts of male versus female, but based on ambition, ability, family ties, and wealth? In The Real Valkyrie, I reread texts and re-examine archeological finds with these questions in mind. I use what my research uncovers to recreate the world of one warrior woman in the Viking Age. First, I gave her a name. I call her Herver, after the warrior woman in a classic Old Norse poem. As the archeologists tell me, her bones and teeth tell us she was 30 to 40 when she died. She ate well all her life, which means she came from a rich family, if not a royal one. At over five foot seven, she was taller than most people around her. Five foot five was the average height of a man in 10th century Scandinavia. The chemistry of her teeth tell us that she was not a native of Birka, where she was buried, but came from somewhere in southern Sweden or Norway. She sailed from there before she was eight, but did not arrive in Birka until she was over 16. Where did she travel? If all I had were her bones, I could only wonder, but I could also study what was buried with her. She was seated in her grave surrounded by weapons. None of them are fancy. None are simply for show. Her sword is a type rare in Norway, but more often found along the Vikings' east way, the trade route through what is now Russia and Ukraine to Byzantium and beyond. Her sax knife in its elaborate bronze and silver sheath is also Eastern, inspired by the equipment of the Magyar horse archers who harassed the Vikings along the east way. Herver was an archer herself. Only 18 graves at Birka contain a horse, and she has two, both with bridles. Her iron stirrups are all that remain of her saddle. By her side were 25 armor-piercing arrows. Between the arrows and her sax knife was a bare spot, the right shape for a bow, which had disintegrated. But Herver was not solely a mounted archer. She was buried with almost every Viking weapon known, sword, sax knife, arrows and bow, ax, two spears and two shields. She was buried with more weapons than any other warrior in Birka, more than almost every Viking in the world. Of those Vikings found buried with weapons at all, only 15, 15% have three or more. What did Herver wear? Did she fight in a classic apron dress like these reenactors at York are wearing? No, based on what little remains of her clothing, Herver dressed like the other Birka warriors in a mix of Slavic, steppe nomadic, and Byzantine fashion. Under a classic Viking cloak, Herver wore a caftan made of silk. In her grave was a scrap of fabric woven from silk and silver threads along with a scattering of mirrored sequins. 
On her head, she wore a silk cap topped by this filigreed silver cone. An, an exact match for the cone was buried with a warrior near Kiev. Who was this Valkyrie buried in grave BJ581? To tell Hever's story, I had to make assumptions. I had to connect the dots. Her bones say she lived to be at least 30, but archeologists can rarely date their finds within a span of 30 years. Details about her grave suggest she died here at Birka before its warrior's hall burned down around 965. That sets her birth at around 930. Where? Science tells me only that she came from Southern Sweden or Norway. I've opted for Vestfold in Norway. Here, a hundred years before Hever's birth, two powerful women were buried in the most lavish, lavish Viking grave ever uncovered, the Oseberg Ship Mound. Here, when Hever was a child, the great hall at Kaupang was destroyed, perhaps by Eric Bloodaxe and Gunhild, mother of kings, who conquered Vestfold around that time. Where would a small girl born, born in Kaupang to a rich family end up? Science suggests she went west, possibly even to the British Isles, as did Eric and Gunhild, according to the Icelandic sagas. From their base in the Orkney Islands, the royal pair meddled in the politics of Dublin and York. Gunhild, mother of kings, appears in 11 Icelandic sagas and several histories. One calls the years she ruled Norway alongside her sons, the age of Gunhild. Irish chronicles at the same time tell of the Vikings in Dublin and the Irish Sea, including one warrior woman called the Red Girl. I don't know how or when Herver arrived in Birka in Sweden, but before her death, she traveled on the East Way to Kiev and back, assuming that is where she got the silver cone for her silk cap. What else other than my outline of Herver's life links Dublin and York to Kalpan, Birka, and Kiev, the Viking slave trade, through which young men and women were exchanged for Byzantine silk and Arab silver. In Kiev, Pervo meets Olga, leader of the Viking Rus, shown here in 11th century frescoes. Olga's story is told in the Russian primary chronicle. And again, there's no question she is real and a war leader. Her destruction of a city once labeled legendary has been proved by archeologists to contain a core of truth. What I learned writing The Real Valkyrie leads me to believe that there is also a core of historical truth in a Byzantine account of Olga's son's last battle in 971. As the victors were robbing the corpses, it says, they found women lying among the fallen equipped like men, women who had fought against the Romans together with the men. Our Herva was not among them. She had already been buried, surrounded by her weapons in Birka grave BJ 581. But I would be very surprised if she was the only woman in the Viking world who was a professional warrior. So now Carrie, I'm gonna let you ask me all those questions you have prepared. And I'll turn off my screen share here and we can go for it. Great. Well, I have a lot of questions. Oh and I boy, know, I know you do. <laughs> and I know we're trying to wrap this up by six o'clock. Um, the, the, my first question, I wanna know what inspired you to write this book. Um, during our last INL US webinar together, you admitted that the inspiration be behind a, a good horse has no color was your husband's support of the idea of you getting an Icelandic horse mm -hmm. if you wrote a book about it. Right, right. So that, that's genius incentive. Um, well, that was, <laughs> that was my first book, uh, Good Horse Has No Color. And it inspired me to figure out how to quit my job at Penn State University and write books full time. Uh, so that's what I have been doing since 2003. So the question is not, am I going to write another book? I mean, that's what I do for a living. But what am I going to write? And this book actually started um, 
as soon as I finished my previous book, Ivory Vikings, which came out in 2015, uh, that is a history of the Lewis chessmen. And I argue that they were carved in Iceland in around 1200 by a woman named Margaret, Margaret the Adroit. And one of the things that I uh, talk about in that book is the history of chess. And when did the chess queen come in onto the board? And that happened in the 10th century in Europe. Now, what else was happening in the 10th century? Well, this is the same time that Hervor, the real Valkyrie, was living. Uh, there were a lot of very powerful women, including the Queen of Norway, Gunhild, mother of kings. It was also when um, the stories of the Valkyries and the shield maids uh, were being uh, written or compiled, not actually written, but compiled and told. And Margaret lived in Iceland when the sagas were being written down and when uh, the poems were being collected. And she was also related to Snorri Sturluson's foster brother. So uh, she was in his household. So she would have known these stories of Valkyries and shield maids and, and powerful queens. And that may have inspired you know, the, the chess queens that she carved for the Lewis chess set. But it also made me start thinking about this question of, of powerful women and women warriors. You know, chess is a war game. What is a woman doing on the chessboard? Um, this kind of implied to me that it was normal for people in the 10th century to think of women as fighting. You know, this is a battle. The chess set is a battle. So if a woman's on the chessboard, why was this accepted? Uh, the next question was, so maybe the Valkyries are real? And I thought, Okay, I need to look at the archaeology here. How do we know if a buried warrior is male or female? You know, where does this idea come from that Viking warriors were all men? So that's when I, I sought out Neil Price, whose books um, I found to be very inspirational. He, he had written about Valkyries and, and I'd used that in Ivory Vikings. And so I decided, you know, he's the expert I want to talk to. And I met him in Orlando and and, you know, I didn't know that he actually was then part of this team working on the DNA testing of a warrior burial and discovering that it really was a female. And, you know, then, as I said in, in my talk, uh, this is how um, the story that I thought I was going to write about bones became more a story about bias, because when that... Uh, paper was published in 2017, the backlash from scholars was really you know, quite surprising to me, uh, to Neil, to the other people on his team, um, that people didn't immediately believe the science. Uh, this is, you know, the DNA testing was the most advanced science we have to look at these archeological questions and that wasn't enough. So, the question that I decided I needed to, to address was, you know, how does history change if we change our assumptions? And, you know, so that's, that's sort of where this, this book began. There's so much. In I know book. there's so much. <laughs> so much in this book. Um, how, how did you, what, what kind of research did you do? I mean, was this mostly book research? Were you out in the field going to archeological sites? You were meeting people at conventions and having conversations in hallways, I'm sure. But what else, all of the above, other things? Um, it, it builds on all my previous books. So the first book I wrote about women in the Viking age was The Far Traveler, and that came out in 2006. And I have all my files from that book. So I have a lot of information on archeology, span archeological techniques, um, but is also women in the Viking age and women's status. Um, and actually I think six of my books use the Icelandic sagas and the Eddas as sources. So I'm, I'm very familiar with, with that you know, original material. I've also been to Iceland, I think it's about 30 times now, starting in the 1980s. Um, I've traveled in Norway, Denmark, Greenland, and Scotland to, to uh, Viking sites. So for this book, um, 
I didn't actually go to any live archaeological sites. I went to Sweden and I interviewed uh, Charlotte Hedenstierna Jonsson, who was the lead researcher on the Birka Warrior. And I saw the artifacts in the Swedish History Museum in Stockholm, but most of the artifacts from BJ581 were on tour at that time, so I didn't get to actually see them. Um, I did take a boat to Birka and wandered around on the the island and, and saw the spot where, where BJ581 was buried and, uh, you know, got the grand tour from their general tour guide there. Um, I went to Norway, uh, which I'd been to a couple times before, but I went to specifically the ancient kingdoms of Vestfold and Agdir, which are just a little bit south of Oslo on the Oslo Fjord. And I wanted to see the uh, the grave mounds, the, uh, there's, there's a number of grave mounds at Bore who have, that have not been excavated. And then there's the mounds at Oseberg and Gokstad where the famous ships uh, were found in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, the ships that really um, create our, our vision of you know, what a Viking ship should look like. So I wanted to see those places. And there just happened to be a Viking music festival being held among the grave mounds at Bore uh, in August of 2018, which was, was when I got to go. And so I planned my trip around this Viking uh, festival and there was um, recreations of Viking instruments and uh, rituals. There were concerts in their reconstructed Viking hall. Uh, there was you know, people who were um, presenting themselves as, as seers and and shaman and, and this kind of stuff. And I got to um, uh, take uh, to, to listen to two lectures by um, Einar Selvik, who is the singer from Wardruna, um, who has done a lot of, of really amazing recreations of Viking instruments and uh, trying to imagine what things might have sound like. And he also had some, some really insightful comments about music and magic and the connection between the two. And so he very much inspired uh, a scene in the book where, where the character Hervor uh, takes part in a, in a ritual, in a, um, uh, a sacrifice to the gods and, and uh, uh, a religious ritual. Then I also traveled to York and Dublin, which were two places that I wanted to uh, set parts of the book. And there's not much left of the Viking Age in York and Dublin, but I could get a sense of the place, of the weather, the way the light falls and things like that. Um, I really wanted to travel on the East Way from Sweden through the Baltic Sea to Russia, but I put that off until too late and COVID hit <laughs> and there was no more travel. So I got to do that virtually. And it is really surprising now how much research you can do virtually. I mean, all the museums, the Swedish History Museum and all the museums in Scandinavia have their full collections online. So I could look up BJ581 and get really good photographs of every artifact in the grave, you know, what the grave looked like, all, the, all of the notes from the original archeologist in the 1800s, the pictures of him, you know, pictures of the work. Um, but I would say that most of my research was done by reading. And uh, because I knew you were gonna ask me this question, I counted how many new books and journal articles I added to you know, my, my notes just for this book. And it came to a little over 300. So I do a lot of reading. So, you know, 300, you know, archeological and literary and historical studies are condensed into this book. Plus, you know, stuff I knew already. Right, you, you already had a very wealthy yeah. background going into this project. But, but as I, I tried to point out, I mean, a lot of the things that I thought I knew, things that I thought were facts, I found out really weren't facts, they were assumptions. And so I had to do constant rethinking of what the Viking world looked like and what a woman's place in the Viking world looked like. I, was, I had to keep coming up against, you know, do I know this or do I just believe it? You know, is this true or is this just an assumption? So I had to you know, constantly be testing this sort of thing. 
Yeah, um, we do have a question from the audience. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll set mine aside for a minute. And <laughs> um, okay. Will Beaton asks, um, he, so, and Will Beaton already had his chance. He got to ask me questions for about an hour. Oh. <laughs> should we not? Should we not do Will's question? Oh, we can take that. We can. Take okay. That. So <laughs> Will says, "Thank you very much, Nancy. In your book, you explain how cannabis seeds have been discovered buried in the <laughs> Viking graves, and you include references to cannabis use in your dramatizations. What mm -hmm. else do you know about cannabis use in the Viking world? And do you think Herrera would uh, vote to legalize it today?" <laughs> um, I don't present her as a witch or a shaman. Um, so I think that it was probably uh, highly specialized who got to, to use um, you know, mind altering drugs back then because it was part of the power of, of the witch, of the, of the, you know, I'm using witch in a very large sense, the person who uh, conducted the religious rituals to have this uh, otherworldly, experience. And so she would have kept very close control over who got to share this experience with her, um, probably only her apprentice. So I don't think that uh, Herver would have a chance to, to try cannabis, but certainly uh, people did use it in the Viking age. Uh, you have to remember that hemp comes from the same plant and hemp makes a very good rope. It can also be used to uh, make clothing. So they certainly had the plant back then and they would have used it for lots of different things. And David had a question. Um, he asked whether you participated in an archeology span dig uh, near Glambauer in, in Iceland. Yeah, and that was uh, that was for the far traveler. I did that in uh, 2005. And are there other important digs underway in Iceland that you are interested in participating in? There are lots of them underway and there's lots of them that I'm interested in, but participating is not that easy. Uh, you have to kind of get on the list. So I, I won't be, I don't think I'll be doing that again. That was a once in a lifetime opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, take part in that dig. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not trained as an archaeologist, so they, they really don't need me there to, to uh, you know, carry mud. <laughs> That's pretty much all I'm, I'm uh, qualified for. But well, I like to watch. One of, so um, there were a lot, there was a lot of information in this book that surprised me. Um, women, women were, were Viking warriors. <laughs> women, uh, Vikings were really into silk, uh, at least for mm -hmm. a time. Uh, that mm -hmm. was new to me. I mean, I'm not, not well versed by any means, but th there were a lot of, wow, really? Moments yeah. for me. Um, what surprised you the most when you were researching this book? Well, what I think was, was the most fun to discover was how good some of the sagas were that I've always overlooked. Um, these are the sagas of ancient times. And you know, I, I had been taught that they were repetitious and unrealistic and they were just filled with fabulous creatures like dragons and warrior women. And once you kind of accept the idea that warrior women are not dragons, um, I was surprised by how realistic these sagas are. Uh, we think of the Icelandic family sagas as being the, the real good ones. You know, these are the, the classic sagas of the settlement of Iceland and there's real people and you can trace your heritage back to them. Whereas the sagas of ancient times are set in ancient times. So some of the characters are legendary, some of them are real. Um, there's a, there's a bigger gap between when things happen and when the stories were written down, so we really can't tell. And yeah, there are dragons, but there's dragons in just about every piece of medieval literature that I know of. Um, but there's descriptions that scholars used to discard as fantasy that I realized modern research has proved to be true. And one of these, for instance, is this great description in Hrolf's saga, the saga of Hrolf Gotrikson, of a battle at a fortified town. 
And scholars always said, well, this must be based on later medieval ideas of towns because Vikings didn't have fortified towns. The research at Birka over the last 20 years has shown that the town of Birka had fortifications that almost exactly match the description in this saga, Hof saga. Uh, there are wooden walls, there are earthen fortifications, there are archers on the walls, there are stakes and rocks in the harbor, there are beacons, uh, watchfires on the, on the hills and islands nearby so they can get warning when enemies are coming. And even the strategy that is described in the saga um, for trying to um, protect the town is the same as how Birka was designed according to the archeologists. So the strategy is, is by the king of this town <clears throat> who happens to be a woman, her name is Thorn, Thornbjörk. And she, when they, they've been attacked and the enemy is about to undermine the walls. They've been digging under the walls. So they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna make it in. And so she has her people, her townspeople, package up all the loot, all their valuables and leave it in an obvious place in the middle of the room to put food out, to put you know, ale on the table. <clears throat> and then they all go out through their own escape tunnel into the woods. And you know, the, the common people are supposed to hide there while the archers all go back in and climb up through the, the, the secret you know, entrances in the outside of the wall. So they get up on the top of the walls and they're gonna be shooting the enemy like you know, fish in a fish pond because the enemy is going to be drinking and eating and arguing over who gets the loot. So it's like this, this perfect you know, scenario describing the town of Birka, which the archeologists um, have said, the walls were designed to be both protecting the town, but also to trap the enemy inside. Now in the saga, the plan doesn't work because the attacking king, Prolf, uh, is pretty smart. He suspects a trap. He catches them when they're still in the woods and they haven't regrouped and the you know, archers haven't gotten back on the walls. You know, he doesn't let his, his uh, army eat the food or drink the, the ale or, or you know, argue over the loot. Um, and so he captures the, the king, the queen, uh, Thornberg, and she has to marry him. And that's usually how it happens in these sagas of ancient times that you know, the woman ends up having to marry the guy and not be a warrior anymore. But in this case, uh, they actually become a pretty good team because later Rolf is captured in Ireland and she sends out her spies. She finds out what has happened. She puts together an army and she leads this army to rescue him. And then comes my favorite scene in this saga where they have broken into the town, they've set it on fire. And she's saying, we have to find Rolf. So the soldiers are going through the town, breaking open doors and suddenly Rolf comes running out from this house that's on fire. He doesn't have any armor or anything. And he comes face to face with this big, strong, frightening warrior. And the saga sets up this scene beautifully where he's not sure if he's gonna be saved or he's gonna be killed. He's terrified. And then the warrior takes off her helmet and it's his wife. And it's just like this gorgeous, you know, scene that just shows that they couldn't tell, you know, if, if, if you're dressed up as a, as a fighter and you look like a fighter, well, then you are a fighter. So that's, that was a really fun to discover that these sagas that I'd always been told were kind of the, you know, the B team of sagas were really, you know, quite good. I mean, the, the characterizations are good, the plots are good, and okay, it could use some editing, but so could some of the other sagas. Well, um, speaking of sagas, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in, in The Real Valkyrie and in Song of the Vikings, you take the sort of side-eyed view of Snorri and question the accuracy of his, of his portrayal of women <laughs> um, as having been heavily influenced by his mm -hmm. Christian beliefs, and you paint a pretty unflattering portrait of, of poor Snorri. Um, as a lover and scholar of Icelandic history and the sagas, was it 
difficult to to write about this ugly self-serving side of a man <laughs> we owe so much to right um i, I think um i think we have a problem uh, even in the modern times, separating the writer from the person. Uh, great writers are not always good people. Uh, the two don't go together. So Snorri is a great writer. I would argue that he's the greatest writer of the Middle Ages. And you know, Tolkien argued that too, that he's even better than, than Shakespeare. I mean, he clearly is our best and maybe our only source of Norse mythology, of the history of Norway in the Viking Age, he probably wrote Egil Saga, which means that he created the genre of Icelandic family saga because that's considered to be the first one. He established saga style. You can see this if you read the sagas that were written before his and the ones that were written after his, he really you know, put his mark on it. But he was a terrible misogynist. Um, you know, when I wrote Song of the Vikings, I got to know him very, very well. And he was not at all nice to his mother or to his daughters or to his wife or to the women that he had children with. Um, he just you know, didn't like or understand women and he didn't write about them very much either. Uh, when you think of, you know, as a writer, when you look at a new project, you think of who is your audience and who is your purpose? So I looked at Snorri's books. Who was his audience and what was his purpose? Well, his audience was generally, at least for the Edda and Heimskringla, the 16 year old king of Norway who had been raised by bishops and knew nothing about his Viking heritage. Um, Snorri's purpose was to gain an influential position at court. And he thought he should be the court poet, the skald as Icelanders had been for you know, centuries in Norway. So he was writing these books to impress this young man to you know, get a good job and also to kind of fly under the radar of the bishops who controlled the young king. So women in the books are Mary or Eve. They're either the honored mother or the object of lust. And he pretty much left out all the tales of the goddesses that he must have known because he knew their names, but he doesn't tell us anything much about them. Except he does give us some glimpses. And the one, the one piece that I found to be really critical writing this book, um, and Snorri is the, is the person who, who pre preserves this for us, is the Norse creation myth. And you can see this glimpse of the pre-Christian mind when you look at the creation myth. Um, it goes like this. Uh, in the beginning, there were two logs, two uh, pieces of driftwood that washed up on the shore. And three gods who were out wandering came upon these two logs and decided to shape them into human shape. And then they brought them to life with blood, breath, and curious minds. Now, if you think of the Christian cre creation myth, Eve is an afterthought. You know, she's made from Adam's rib. Adam is made in the image of God and Eve is made from his rib to be his helpmate. In the Norse myth, Embla, the woman from the elm tree and Ask, the man from the ash tree are both wood. They're both made at the same time by the same gods. And if you look at what ash and elm are good for, and this is something I actually discovered after I wrote the book, um, Ash was used for spear shafts and oars, and elm was used for wagon wheels and hunting bows. So both woods have uses in peace and in war. And I think that was probably true about the men and women of the Viking Age, that they were the same, you know, similar and equal, but had roles that were decided by their abilities and their qualities, not by their gender. So Snorri gives us that. So I have to I have to thank him for that. But in general, um, I can I can agree that he was a very great writer and very grateful for him. But he was not a nice person. And uh, if I write about him again, that's, he's not going to be a nice person again. <laughs> not going to change. Not going to change. No, not trustworthy at all. 
Well, we're down to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to talk about boats. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> this was another surprise for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think boats, the boats factor into a few of your books. You have a lot mm -hmm. of, seem to have a lot of knowledge about boats. And the boat that you describe Hero using um, to travel the East Way is not the type of vessel we commonly associate with Vikings. And could you just spend a couple minutes describing how it's different and, and why? Yeah. This is another one of the surprises um, when I was when I was working on this book. You know, I had this concept that the Gokstad ship and the Oseberg ship were, you know, the classic Viking ships, especially Gokstad, which is is you know so beautifully streamlined, is is such a work of art. Um, it's about seventy six feet long. It takes a crew of thirty five, and it weighs about twenty tons. And Every time archaeologists have tried to figure out how did the Vikings travel from Sweden through Russia, down the Russian rivers to Kiev, you know, and then farther on to Constantinople and, and Baghdad even, uh, how are you going to get a 20-ton ship to portage down these little rivers? And experimental archaeologists have tried it. You know, they've made replicas uh, and they've tried it because the Gokstad ship is built in around 900 and that's when they were traveling the East Way. So, you know, we're sort of like, OK, how, how did this work? And they tried doing it with you know, horses to, to pull the ship and even, you know, started using machinery, which the Vikings would not have had. And they decided that it must be just fiction, fantasy that the Vikings actually got to Constantinople. Well, so along comes a um, young woman archeologist who discovers that a third ship, a third Viking ship was dug out of Sweden um, in about the same time as the Gokstad and the Oseberg, but it was in really bad shape and nobody bothered to actually put the pieces back together. The, the, um, the Swedish farmer was digging a ditch and he came upon this, this boat and he preserved the pieces. They became the, the start of a museum, but nobody could actually put them back together. So Gunilla Larsson uh, recreated this ship. She, she put the pieces back together, then she built a replica, and then she started uh, sailing it and portaging it and finding out how it works. And this is the Vix boat. And it is 31 feet long. It takes a crew of eight to 10. And it only weighs about half a ton. So that's a little bit more than an Icelandic horse. Um, 20 tons versus half a ton. You can easily portage an Icelandic horse, you know, a half a ton boat. And in fact, um, not her, but someone else did take another replica of the Vix boat, sailed on the Baltic Sea to Novgorod, then south about 250 miles through Russia and into Ukraine. And it was quite easy to, to portage the boat. So this is the kind of ship that they used on the East Way. And it's not at all like our image of a Viking ship. It's more like a, a voyager's canoe, you know, that was used in the fur trade in, in America, in Canada. So uh, it really changes our idea about what is a Viking ship. And the other thing that Gunilla uh, found out, which was just as wonderful, is that when you look in this part of Sweden as to who is buried in a boat and who is buried you know, in a wagon, um, the standard thinking was always that men were buried in boats and women were buried in wagons. In this part of Sweden, it's the reverse. The women are buried in the boats and the men are buried in the wagons. So she kind of blew that, that uh, gender stereotype out of the water too and makes it much more logical that women were among the traders who were going on the East Way and that women were even among the warriors who were protecting the traders on the East Way, that this was, you know, a, a big community um, effort, not just a couple of men who did it. So it's a, it's a really neat, you know, rethinking of Viking history. It is. Um... 
I suspect many of your readers like me will want to, will, will finish this book and then want to learn more. Um, mm -hmm. So do you have um, other authors or books or blogs besides yourself? Of yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You have other books. You have Read all my books first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if you see the bookcase behind me. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could, I could pretty much recommend all of those. Um, but I did, I did try to pick out three for you. <sighs> and I will also say in, in, in your book, mm -hmm. you also, uh, of course, have a lot of great resources. Yeah, there's a, there's a reading list in the back of the book. There's also, um, you know, a whole lot of notes that, that refer to other things that you might want to read. But um, this one here, I would recommend. <sighs> by Neil yeah. Price, Children of Ash and Elm. Okay. Um, you know, all three of these books pretty much just came out this year, last year. And Neil's book um, really is an overview of the most recent research on the Viking Age. And um, although he and I don't agree on everything, I learned an awful lot from him uh, when he's talking about women's roles and also the importance of slavery in the Viking Age, which we don't often talk about. Mm -hmm. um, then there is this one, uh, Valkyrie, by Johanna Katrin Friedrich's daughter. Uh, this is more the traditional view of the roles of women in the Viking world, though she's brought it up to date and she has included all of those sagas of ancient times that I, I um, say we usually overlook. Um, Johanna does not agree with me that BJ581 really changes the conversation about uh, women's roles, but the way I see it is I'm more interested in the exceptional women and she's writing about the average women. So if you think of, you know, what most women's lives were like, you know, Johanna is, is describing that. And I'm talking about the ones who became like the Olympic athletes or the Marines of their time. So not everybody could do this. Uh, and then there is uh, this uh, brand new book that I haven't had a chance to read by Leszek Gardela, Women and Weapons in the Viking World. And I'm familiar with Leszek's book, he, uh, his work, because I've read quite a lot of his papers. And he has been working for a number of years to systematically compile everything we know about Viking women and weapons from archeology, span history, myth, literature, everything. He doesn't speculate like I do and you know, put it together and bring people to life, but he lays out the facts. And, and to me, his data proves that Valkyries were real, but other people might not agree. Good. Well, there's your, you. there's your homework. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I know we're almost out of time. Um, sometimes uh, authors are reluctant to share what they're working on next, but uh, are you working on another book yet? Well, yeah. actually I had a book almost finished when I started this one. And so I finished it uh, just recently and it's with my agent. It's, um, it's actually based on my travels in Iceland over the years. And the question that that book wants to answer is, when I say Icelanders believe in elves, why do you laugh? <laughs> so at some point that will come out. Um, um. And what I'm calling it now is looking for the hidden folk, how Iceland's elves can save the earth. So you'll have to look forward to that one. Great, good. Um, do you mind, Nancy, if we post the name of your, those three sure. uh, yeah. books? Okay, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we'll get them up in the chat, but maybe we can send them out in the newsletter mm -hmm. or- Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. Well, I am so appreciative of your time and, and information and thank you. The, the best part of this for me was I got the, I got to read it. You got <laughs> it. Advance. That's copy. <laughs> Before anybody else. Yeah. And, and yeah. I've, I've already, um, I've, ar I've already passed it on to my daughter, my, mm -hmm. my almost 15 year old daughter for her to dig into. All right. Um, Good. But, Thank you for the time tonight and thank you for the, the, the labor of love and effort that went into writing this book. Thank you, Carrie. And I can't wait to, uh, to get the book and start reading it. It's, uh, boy, so much left to learn. Holy cow.
Um, uh, thank you to both of you, Nancy and Carrie. Great job again tonight. Um, this has been really, really interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, people have had ample opportunities to ask questions and have gotten as much out of this presentation as I have. Just to let you know, we do have some additional webinars that are in the works. We don't have uh, finalized dates yet for them, uh, but we've got three or four in the works for fall and winter. Uh, we are also awaiting the rescheduling of the conversation with Iceland's ambassador to the US, Birdie Sellert Starter. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to that. She was here about a year and a half ago, and that was uh, such an interesting conversation and so much uh, to learn from her in terms of what, uh, what the ambassadors are involved in and, and their perspectives. So if you're not already a member of the INL US, now would be a really good time to, uh, to join. So just go to www.inlus.org and click join us. Um, Nancy and Carrie, one more time, thank you so much. And thank you to our attendees uh, for, uh, for giving us your time this evening. Good night.